Hola y bienvenidos a World Wonders Podcast. Soy Ryan. Soy Amanda. ¿Qué vamos a hablar hoy, Amanda? <laughs> Todavía estamos en el Gringo Trail. Sí, en Perú. Claro. En Sudamérica. Y hoy vamos a hablar de líneas de Nazca. Sí, sí. Y Huacachina también. Huacachina también. Y para nuestros listeners... <laughs> Uh, estamos a hablar en inglés. Ah, oh, sí. Oh, uh. Yes. Okay. So, welcome to the World Wonders Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amanda, and this is my host, co-host, Ryan. And today we're going to be talking about the Nazca Lines and Huacachina in Peru. So, some prior episode before, we left you somewhere on the Gringo Trail <laughs> in South America, and we're kind of picking that back up. So, after leaving Arequipa... Uh, with a little bit of a sour taste in our mouths, we headed onwards to the Nazca Lines. Yeah, and the Nazca Lines are something really cool and amazing, but not extremely well known for whatever reason. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know what the Nazca Lines are, um, they are ancient geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert. So Peru is pretty interesting because it's got the coast where Lima is, the jungle where Iquitos is, or Puerto Maldonado. Um, the mountains where the Incas were in Machu Picchu. And then it's got this desert, which is pretty, it's pretty crazy because you're just going from these different little microclimates. Anyways, uh, they're pretty like historically unknown exactly where they came from or what they are. But they theorized that basically these ancient civilizations uh, chiseled away lines into the earth. And so by digging up the first layer of this well, red earth... you rise about the lines. The lines are there. Yeah, but sorry, how they made them. The lines are there. And so basically they're these massive lines that go for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers in this Nazca desert. And there's just straight lines. There's animals carved in. And they can essentially only be seen from the tops of the surrounding mountains or from the air, which makes them pretty interesting. Yeah, um, so it's a massive area where they've carved lines into lots of cool shapes, mostly animals, but there's also one where it's, it appears to be like an astronaut. It's called the astronaut because it kind of looks like a, a human with like a dome over his head. If you've never seen any of the Nazca lines, I suggest the best way is to just go on Google and um, check out some of the images because there's some really cool animal shapes and they're gigantic, and you can see them when you're flying in planes over top. I believe that's actually how they were. Um, were they discovered? Someone flying, once commercial air travel happened, someone was flying over top and was like, whoa, what's with these gigantic animals? Yeah, for sure. I think it was discovered by air travel because they're not really distinguish as any, distinguishable as anything from the ground. And it's interesting because there's straight lines that just stretch and stretch. And then there's a lot of geometrical shapes in there. And then there's like, there's a hummingbird. Um, there's the condor, which is the bird that we talked about in our episode on Arequipa and the Colca Canyon, which is kind of the symbol of the bird symbol of Peru. And it's interesting if you have been to Peru or if you've ever seen anything alpaca or any of those knickknacks that people bring back from Peru, a lot of the time the Nazca lines are actually on them. Um, so you may or may not have encountered that on along your life or your travels without even really realizing it. Yeah. And the first time I heard about the Nazca lines was I was reading this book, Fingerprints of the Gods by Graham Hancock. And he is kind of going through all these like ancient ruins around the world and kind of tracing them back to a time period before when they're like commonly dated and trying to like link them all together. But one of the interesting things he brings up is that the in on the Nazca lines, which are according to conventional wisdom made sometime like 400 AD. Yeah, but somewhere between like 400 pretty, and 650 AD, apparently. But apparently, the theories aren't very well um, developed there because it's a desert. There's not much stuff to date. Um, but there's lots of animals there that don't exist in that area. Like there's a spider, which is only. Um, in the jungle, not even the Peruvian jungle. I think like the Brazilian Amazon is the only place the spider is. And they've got a, 
they've carved a gigantic one in the Nazca Mountains. And I think there's a couple other animals too that are nowhere near that region. Like a monkey. And these people are supposed to be like primitive tribal who've like carved these lines, which seems a bit far-fetched anyway. So like a primitive society would carve these lines, but that they'd be able to go, you know, thousands and thousands of miles into a climate that's completely different, see this animal and then be able to draw and replicate it in gigantic form in the desert. So Graham Hancock's theory was that maybe there's a more developed civilization in South America that people weren't really giving them credence to because they want, everyone wants this timeline of people were primitive. They were living in caves and stone age and then they slowly developed up this linear chart to the point we are now. It's just nothing but progress. When the reality is it might be up, down, back, forth. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I didn't read the whole book. It's it's pretty large and it's there's a lot of theory in it, but it's super interesting if you're going to the Egyptian pyramids, Machu Picchu, Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku in Bolivia, uh, the Chichen Itza in like the Mayan Riviera area of Mexico. He's got a lot of really interesting theories around how these sort of ancient civilizations or these ruins actually came to be and that they're just created in such a way that it's it's really hard to believe that people used or developed these things with these simple tools. Um, but the Nazca lines are still being credited to an ancient civilization of Nazca people who are using simple tools and surveying equipment to make it. So it's basically like they set up these wooden like put like wooden stakes in the ground and tied string to it or some form of like rope and like carved out these shapes that are, you know, some of the biggest ones are 200 meters in size. Well, and I think, I think it's all like one line. They're all connected together, all the different shapes over like kilometers of distance. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Like getting to the airport they have, they play these videos, which are alongside that sort of, theory and it's these people acting out how they did it and it's like them it seems kind of kitschy it is kitschy but they've got kilometers and kilometers of these stakes with these um like rope and then people are like basically like digging it out in one straight line and then apparently that's how it happened and it's pretty interesting because the location that it's in is so dry they basically never get rain in nazca but that's had there been rain like the nazca lines would no longer be there but so a couple of like watching those videos and they talk about oh they're just using stakes and chiseling out the lines like it seems like a bit like it's so complex so gigantic and they're all so like perfectly straight it seems weird to think that that is how it actually happened yeah, like that's just my like my common sense view, um, and then also there's another thing where it it's become desert desertified, <laughs> desertification happened. But people think that um, it was lush at one point, and then it became this desert. Oh, interesting. I and they maybe they that. carved the lines as that was happening, but um, it's interesting to think about because it's this amazing thing to see, but when you think about why isn't it popular, like I'd never heard about it, but I definitely heard about Machu Picchu. And it makes me think that maybe like, because you can't take a photo with the Nazca lines, how much do you think that contributes to it not being that popular? I think that that definitely could be a factor playing into people, uh, choosing not to go. I think money is also another factor because you can't really see the Nazca lines without paying for a flight. And the flight isn't overly expensive, but it's also not, cheap if you're on a fairly low budget do you remember how much it was i think it was about 100 bucks canadian yeah and i think there's an option to climb up a tower on the highway to look at um maybe the condor but but i think you really don't get much of you whereas in your you're in the plane you get to see all of them and you're directly above them which is another cool thing to think about like so these people a couple thousand years ago, maybe even more. Having the technology to build those lines is impressive at that point in time. But then, like, there's no way for them to view them, which is like a whole other conundrum altogether. Or yeah, like, it's pretty interesting. It makes you really question what was going on with that civilization. Is it what 
Graham Hancock believes that it's something more advanced because it seems like they were creating something that was large enough to be seen from the sky as if it was trying to send a message to somebody in the sky, which makes me wonder, you know, what sort of technology was there then? There must have been something where that could have been in the sky. Mm-hmm. Or someone to, to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's like a religious thing, like why just the pictures of animals? And like what's with the astronaut guy? Yeah, I'm not too sure about that. It definitely is. When you read stuff online, they do say that it is for religious purposes. Another theory is that it's a a really giant astronomical calendar. And perhaps that's, especially if it was a changing climate, maybe that spider was there, maybe that monkey was there, and they're just trying to capture that. I really don't know. I mean, we could theorize for hours probably. And it's It's cool. It's just so uncertain. Because there's like the the Nazca lines and with, with I think like 10 common shapes. Like you get a card when you get in the plane and they show you all the shapes and you go around and see some of them. But that's just a small part of this entire thing because there's all these crazy lines and patterns going everywhere. And then there's other, farther off, there's other like different line areas that aren't the well-known symbols but are different things, different animals. And then also in Nazca, there's some pyramids that have been found not too long ago. So it's definitely like a cool historical thing going on. And it's weird because um, traveling, like a lot of boat traveling, you see historical stuff. Like you go see the Eiffel Tower, like a lot of what you see in Europe is historical stuff. Um, Even like we talked in Cambodia about going to Angkor Wat and like it was this beautiful historical complex that we felt maybe didn't appreciate as much because we didn't know as much about it. Mm -hmm. But you kind of need to have some level of understanding with historical stuff to appreciate it, don't you think? Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's it's hard with something where there isn't really like definite answers out there. It's like people, you know, they're explaining the things to you about something like the Nazca lines. And there's so many questions that pop into my mind. Like this doesn't make sense in my brain, how this could be the way it is. And it because it makes common, it even more interesting to go and see it firsthand. Because the common theory is about like, it was like 500 AD. This is like a pretty primitive society. They chiseled these lines into the ground for religious purposes or something. Yeah. That's basically what they describe it to as. And it kind of takes a lot of the, excitement or curiosity away from it if you're just going to believe into that because when you actually start thinking about it it doesn't really make sense yeah it's kind of like oh really like that's not that cool at all Mm -hmm. i think that is maybe perhaps why some people choose not to do it because if you're just if you don't know much about nazca and then you hear that and then you find out it's a hundred dollars for you know a ten minute flight. It doesn't sound like it's really worth your bang for your buck. But having read more about it and read alternative theories and engaged myself in it, and then spending the money to do that flight, I think it's super interesting and completely worth the money. Like it's a pretty yeah. pretty cool thing to see and yeah, experience I, firsthand. It's really, really cool. And it makes you wonder, like I knew when I found out about it, it's like, what's weird that I never heard about this before? Because it's a really amazing, mysterious, um, cool thing. And I think there are like, it's a number of things that contribute to it not being popular. Like one, they're just not being like Nazca, it's a desert and it's flat. It's not particularly nice. The only thing there is really the line. So a lot of people hesitate to stop. It costs a lot of money for a short period of time. You can't take a photo with it. You can't do a trek to it. Um, Yeah. And it's also, it's amazing experience, but it was a little bit of a pain in the butt. Yeah. But just before we get into that, like it also has, I think with historical stuff, sometimes you lose a bit of the fascination when it's something that could be done with modern technology. Like the Nazca lines are cool to think about. 2000 years ago but like it's probably reproducible now like with modern survey equipment and like some sort of like dredging tool like you could probably do it so maybe that takes away from some of the allure yeah that's definitely a fair point you could definitely recreate the nazca lines nowadays 
I'm sure you could. It's pretty interesting. And I don't know if it's just growing up in a society where there has been, you know, computers and technology and so many advancements in technology throughout our lifetime. It's so hard for me to comprehend somebody making something that amazing out of such basic tools. And I, I go back and forth between, is that me using my brain and thinking about how this doesn't make sense and questioning that? Or is that me growing up in a society where I can't even comprehend people having the patience or time or abilities to create that by hand? It's kind of a toss up in my brain. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's understandable that you'd like, it's so hard to picture not having the technology that we have. Yeah. Like it's it maybe a bit easier to picture us not having computers because you have a bit of experience with what that looks like, but you know, comprehending not having cars or not having railroads, not having the steam engine. Um, there's yeah. so many technologies that are like these monumental inv- innovations that have such huge impacts on human life that everyone just takes for granted. Like people take for granted like that the engine is just some sort of like force of nature that appeared and made everyone's life, you know, so much better. But it's just like a couple people working hard invented it and like changed the course of history. Yeah. So it's hard to pick. Sorry, the point was it's hard to picture what it's like without those tools and innovations but yeah definitely it's definitely interesting to think about yeah but so for nazca we got a 10 minute really cool fascinating plane ride but you definitely pay the price for that or at least we did in waiting around and feeling frustrated yeah it was interesting because after our experience with the colca canyon we went into a different travel agency to book our nazca lines tour because we heard that it's best to book it ahead of time And it was just, it took forever to do it. We were probably in the tour office for just an hour and a half. Yeah, an hour and a half. And it was painful and it was frustrating. And then we had a painless bus into Nazca. One of the great things about traveling the quote unquote gringo trail in Peru is that your bus rides become a lot shorter and having bused all the way from Ushuaia at the very tip of Argentina all the way up, it felt really great to be on a bus that was only three, four hours, if that. So we arrive in Nazca. It's a tiny little town. You get off the bus and it's all these tour operators just trying to harass you because they want you to take the, their plane. And we'd booked with, I guess, apparently the best the best ones. We go to their... At least according to our travel, <laughs> which is, the, I think they always say, this one's the best one. Yeah, apparently. Who knows? But we booked with a popular one. It was in our guidebook. We'd heard about it. We'd read about it online. It seemed credible because you are in a tiny airplane in what is the third world country. So you do have to be aware of that. And we go to the... Peru is probably a second world country. But... Okay, second world. Yeah, it's probably second world. And then we go to the office. We drop our stuff. We like get in this car right away. And go out and we're like, awesome. This is going to be quick, painless. It's going to be awesome. Like so great. And then we get to the airport and we just wait. Well, like, so we, we, one thing that's kind of frustrating in general about traveling to South America is people don't really like, they're not really honest with you about just things in general, especially like tour guides. So like we get there, it's like, I think what time do you get there? Like 8 a.m. or something? Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay, the airport opens at nine. Yo, well, your guys are on the first flight. Um, it seems a little cloudy, but it should clear up. I'm not sure if you'll get to go at nine, but it'll be like 11. You know, it'll, things will be clear and you'll be good to go. Which, like, I understand that people don't have the ability to, to predict the weather. Like, it's unpredictable. But um, you get the sense that they'll tell you anything just to keep you from balking balking being like abandoning and just continuing on yeah it's like oh yeah it'll be clear in no time don't worry so we get to the airport still not clear i'm like i'm on board with waiting till it's clear but then we find out that when he said first flight he means first flight with that company and our company is actually the way they do it at the airport is each company has a spot in the queue so if there was like four planes with our company there's one plane from each company. Our company was like the eighth or ninth company with the runway. Yeah. So if, if we were 
on the fourth flight with our company, you actually have to wait for like 27 planes to go, which is like four hours or something. Yeah. 30 Um, minutes each plane. And so not only were we not, our company was like eighth or ninth to go, but we weren't even on the first flight of our company. We're scheduled on like the fourth flight or something. Yeah. And so when we had a bus booked, so we had to continually change our bus and they were giving us these low ball estimates of, Oh yeah, don't worry. It'll be going an hour. It'll be going an hour. And then when it finally, the clouds did clear and we found out that we were actually scheduled on like the third plane, it was a frustrating experience. It was. And it's kind of interesting because I feel like in Canada, you know, you call in takeout or pizza or you go to a restaurant and they always highball how long it's going to be. Say like, oh, it'll be there in an hour. And then it shows up in 35 minutes and you're so happy because you expected your food in an hour. And it's the exact opposite thing in South America. Like they take the, the short term reward of having you pleased. And then it's like, oh, we'll just deal with them later when we don't live up to this. Well, it's because there's more of a worry about reputation. Um, and so I think with here, the businesses, yeah, businesses, there's more competition here because it's a freer market. Um, businesses have to worry about their reputation. So if you're a business and you give, say someone comes and asks for what the time, how long it's going to take and you say 30 minutes and it takes 25 minutes, they, they're fine. That doesn't hurt your reputation. They're like you think they're honest. So you'll probably go back again. Cause you know, you get an honest appraisal of how long it's going to take. But maybe if you only have 15 minutes and they tell you it's going to be 25, you don't do any business there, but you'll go back in the future because you know, they're trustworthy. Yeah. Whereas if you're just coming through one time and they tell you it's going to be five minutes and your 15 minutes is your time where you'll say yes or no to you're going to buy a pizza if they tell you five minutes, even if it takes half an hour. So for Nazca, it's like maybe if they tell you it's going to be six hours, you're not going to book. You're just going to do something else. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, they're kind of incentivized if they're not worried about brand reputation to just tell you, Oh yeah, don't worry. It's going to be like half an hour, get your money and then, you know, keep kind of stringing you along. Yeah. And that's completely true. And the Nazca airport too, like there's nothing to do there. And I felt really frustrated because I I was thinking to myself, you know, we were at this amazing coffee shop. We're having some good food, drinking some good coffee, like journaling, writing, reading in this nice environment. And then you take us to this airport so we can just sit there for three hours. Like that just seems boring. Yeah. Productive. Yeah. It would have been nice to just be able to hang out at a coffee shop or because there's no food. There's like food, but nothing good at the airport. I think we just kept buying like little bags of chips. (laughs) to try and keep us full because we were waiting there for like four hours. Um, so definitely something if you are going to do the Nazca lines, which I still really would recommend, definitely just be prepared to be patient and to wait out the weather and to wait out the South American companies. Yeah. And be like cognizant of the weather. Like we booked in advance because we thought that was what you should do, but we didn't really consider the fact that it, might be cloudy because we had been so used to being like you know, at high elevations. It was like clear every single day, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So we didn't really think about it until we got there. So it might be nice if you like actually spend the night in Nazca or like have some idea of the weather forecast. Or get into Nazca and, you know, be prepared to spend the day there and potentially get a place that night if things run late and just be prepared that you're going to see something really amazing, but don't be on a rush to get out to your next spot. Yeah. And if you are going to Peru and hadn't considered NASC lines, I'd say definitely do some research online, look at photos. There's some cool documentaries and YouTube videos about them because they're this really cool, um, mysterious thing. And if you have a bit of interest in it beforehand, you can have a cool experience seeing it firsthand. You also get to ride in like the world's smallest plane, which is really fun. It's not the world's smallest plane. I think it's just like a it's generic pretty, small It's pretty plane. tiny. It's a pretty tiny plane. It's a five-seater plane, mm-hmm. six-seater plane, six-seater. So there's like four people who ride and then a pilot and somebody who will tell you when to look and whatnot. Um, lots of people do get sick on it. So if you do get nauseous or kind of seasick, maybe prepare yourself for that. It's definitely worth it though. So from... 
the Nazca Lines, we went onwards to a little desert oasis called Wakachina. So to get to Wakachina, you actually take a bus from Nazca or from Arequipa to the town of Ica or the little city of Ica. And then from Ica, you take a little taxi into Wakachina. And Wakachina is big on the Gringo Trail. Almost anyone who's traveling the coast of Peru stops in Wakachina. So most of the buses and taxi cabs know when they see that you're a foreign, that you're probably going to Wakachina. Yeah, it seems like anyone going to Ica really is just going to Wakachina, which is like a suburb distance away from Ica. Yeah, I think it's like three kilometers maybe. It's cool though. Um, Wakachina is like, if you think of a desert oasis in your head, it, the imagery is probably similar to Wakachina. There's a, a lake kind of surrounded on all sides by sand dunes with kind of development just encircling the lake, but not really further than that. Um, there's lake, trees, and then beyond that, just big sand dunes in either direction. Yeah, I think there's about three hostels in Wakachina, maybe three hotels as well. I think one nightclub, five restaurants, one coffee shop. It's pretty, it's pretty bare bones. It's pretty small. Yeah. It's smaller than I would have expected given what I'd heard about it. Yeah. Traveling on the Gringo Trail, especially once you get into Peru, Wakachina becomes one of those stops where people just kind of ask you, Oh, have you been to Wakachina? Oh, are you going to Wakachina? And I'd heard about it from my friend who traveled to Peru a few years ago when I went to Machu Picchu the first time. And she had said it was pretty cool. So between everything we'd heard and what I read in Lonely Planet, it sounded pretty neat. And it is. It's cool. Um, I have a photo of it during the day when the sun's out and it is a perfect little desert oasis. And when we first got there, we thought it would be the perfect place to find a nice coffee shop and just chill out, maybe like read books in a hammock, spend all day journaling at a coffee shop. And it's interesting because the main activity to do there is dune bugging. So basically, as soon as the sun rises, you're overwhelmed by the sound of dune buggies all day. Yeah, because it's kind of like a funnel. Like the sound really, really, you can hear it everywhere in the town. Um, from these dune buggies ripping up these sand dunes. So you think of, you see the picture and you're like, wow, it's like scenic, what like a perfect place to just like stay a while and relax. But it's, yeah, you're just kind of annoyed by the dune buggy sound. But it's, you go out dune buggy and you have a cool experience like sandboarding, but beyond that. I think we booked two nights because we had this idea in our head that it was going to be this serene place to hang out and spend some time. In reality, it is a cool place to stop, but I would probably only do one night, do the sunset, dune, bugging, sandboarding adventure, and then probably the next day continue on. Yeah. Just because there's no grocery stores, the food there is pretty overpriced just because there isn't that many options. Um, although it's pretty good, we did go to a Thai food restaurant, I think twice. We'll yeah, there's there. one really good restaurant near. There's, so there's the hostel with bananas. Yeah. Hostel? Yeah, Bananas Hostel. Not which really. is kind of like one of the top rated ones in Peru, really famous. We didn't stay there. But across from that, there's this cool guest house, um, Thai food place. Yeah, which is pretty nice. Uh, we actually ran into this South African couple who'd been on our Kolka Canyon tour. We ended up at the Nazca lines with them. And so we spent a lot of our time at the airport getting to know them, which was pretty interesting. And then we ran into them when we got to Wakachina. They were coming for dinner at the hostel we were staying at and we were heading elsewhere. And we ended up going for dinner with them. And it was pretty cool to connect with two people on more of a deeper level who weren't in our demographic. Yeah. And that's one of the amazing things about traveling is you, you've got something in common with everyone just like by being where you are at that time. So it's like when you're at home, you probably wouldn't meet someone who's like 30 years older than you and go for dinner with them. Right. You wouldn't, I probably wouldn't at least maybe that's just me, but uh, maybe not traveling. It's cool. You really get to meet people who have had um, a lot more life experience, different life experiences and you get to find more about find out more about them. Yeah. And these two in particular are pretty cool because they were traveling pretty similar to the way we were. I mean, they were staying at a nicer place than us in Wakachina, but definitely 
down to earth people. And it was so interesting to hear about their life in South Africa and their perspectives on Peru and the Peruvian culture and Peruvian tourism as well. So it's definitely interesting to spend some time getting to know people who were out of that demographic that we usually spend time with and who we usually spend time with at home. Yeah. But the one thing, so Honka China, when you think about it now, I think like really cool setting, but kind of like disappointing. Why do you feel disappointed in Wakachina? Just because I remember looking at photos of it before and being like, wow, this is amazing. Like, it's just like so serene and perfect. And then, yeah, not really like anything good to do during the day. No, I mean, it's definitely, it's good to come in, do the dune biking in the evening. Most of them go out around 4 p.m. and you rip around on these sand dunes and these massive dune buggies. And that's what ev- like everyone who goes to Wakachina goes on the sandboarding dune buggy. It's like what you do there. I mean, I don't know. There's not really anything else to do to there. I guess like you have the option. Like I, a lot of people climb sand dunes in the morning to watch the sunrise. And a lot of people climb sand dunes at night to watch the sunset or go on the tour at sunset. Yeah. And then other than that, you can basically just hang out in this little town. You and there's not, not a ton of like great stuff. Bar. <laughs> not a ton of stuff places to go during the day to hang out no not at all so i'd say definitely don't go to wakachina for a long time it's nice to split up the bus ride because if you're coming from arequipa to wakachina you would have quite the bus ride you'd be overnight plus four or so hours so probably a 13 hour bus ride it'd be nice to like split up that bus ride before heading onwards to lima i think just don't go in there with too many high expectations or the expectations that it is this quote unquote oasis because it is, it's noisy and it is more about the adventure activities than actually having that relaxation. And wasn't the bus ride from Arequipa to Nazca actually longer than a couple hours? I think it was overnight. Yeah, I think you are actually right on that. I'm remembering now waking up on the bus with our South African friends. So I was incorrect on that. Arequipa to Nazca, I think it's about nine hours. It's a pretty short overnight bus, but... It is nine hours, so mm. I mean, if you've traveled south South America, then it that's not really a long bus ride, but it's like a nice overnight ride for sure, time wise. So, do you have anything else to add about Wakachina or Nazca? Um, go to Nazca, splurge on the flight. It's definitely worth it. Read up on the Nazca lines. Start thinking. Email us your opinions or theories at the World Wonders Podcast at gmail dot com. Yeah, definitely. Think if you're going to go to Nazca. Or you're thinking about not going, I would do some research about what Nazca is. And if you are thinking about going, do some research beforehand too. Because it adds, I think, to to your experience if you have kind of a collection of these theories in your mind about where these things came from, why they're there. Because it's it's cool. Yeah, for sure. Until next time. Bye.